morning. Thank you for joining us for what you need to know to accurately simulate gas turbine high altitude relight. Today's webinar is presented by Scott Drennan of Convergent Science. Scott's been with us for three years and is the director of gas turbines and after treatment applications. He has a master's in mechanical engineering from UC Irvine, and his previous professional experience includes power generation product line leader and emission services manager at the Electric Power Research Institute, also known as EPRI, R&D manager at Cohen Burner Company, as well as director of applications and engineering services at Reaction Design. I'd also like to mention that Scott will serve as Technical Organizing Chair for Gas Turbines at the 2017 AIAA SciTech Forum in January in Grapevine, Texas. At this time, I will now turn the floor over to Mr. Drennan. Great. Thank you very much, Tiffany. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, we've got well over a hundred attendees, as I can see, from uh, far away places like India and close places like Texas and uh, and Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, so today what I'll be talking about is modeling gas turbine relight. Uh, gas turbine relight is a, uh, a key issue, uh, should you ever need it, uh, having a flame out. And so um, uh, the, abil the ability to do uh, relight or design engines that are robust in relight situations is extremely important and it has been a challenge to model that or to use simulation to support that design and I'll talk through some of the issues uh, and some of the challenges and then uh, talk through some of the approaches and, and, and work that we've been doing with Converge CFD uh, looking specifically at gas turbine relight. As Tiffany mentioned, there's a way to ask questions during the webinar. Please feel free to type in your question during the webinar. Uh, at the end of the webinar, I'll do my best to look through the questions and see if I can answer some of those directly, or I promise you someone will respond to you uh, after the webinar should we not address your question directly. But go ahead and open up this little dialog box at the bottom of the uh, webinar control panel and uh, type in your questions. Let me do a little brief history of convergent science. Uh, while we aren't uh, that old, we have certainly been around and doing CFD for a long time. Um, convergent science started in 1997 with a group of graduate students from the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, frankly, they design uh, meshes for Kiva for a long period of time as a services organization. Uh, and then they decided to develop their own CFD code and what that became was Converge CFD. Now that code was designed uh, with the advice and guidance of a commercial engine manufacturer, so it's designed specifically to address the key things that engine manufacturers and combustion designers, uh, atomizer designers need. Uh, in 2008, uh, Convergent Science got the ability to sell commercial uh, Converge CFD licenses, and we started about five employees back then in 2008. Um, as uh, Tiffany mentioned, I joined about three years ago, and we opened a Texas office in 2012, uh, signed a new distributor in Asia that helps service in Asia, and since then we've opened offices in, uh, uh, in Austria, in Linz, Austria, and also an office in Detroit. So from uh, 2008, of about five approaching about 100 employees, and uh, while a lot of our work is done to support uh, internal combustion engines or piston engine design, where we have just about 91 of the 98 manufacturers in the world using Converge for that, Converge is also being used for uh, gas turbines and other areas as well. So that's what we're talking about here today. Here's uh, just a map to show you where we are distributed. Uh, I work in the New Braunfels, Texas office. Our headquarters is in Madison. In fact, I'm up in Madison uh, giving the presentation here today. But like I said, we have offices in the UK, uh, in Linz, uh, and a distributor in uh, China, Korea, and Japan, and in India as well. So we're a worldwide organization. Let me talk just a couple highlights about uh, um, about Converge for gas turbines. And this talks uh, about a paper that we did a couple years ago, uh, looking at predicting um, no uh, emissions or lean direct injected gas turbine combustor. Uh, 
Uh, this was funded by NASA, and we did this work and paper with Parker Hannifin. Um, in this case, we used detailed and, and you can see over here on the right, uh, we did a good job of predicting the trends of emissions over a fairly wide range of flame temperatures, which is essentially fuel air ratio or equivalence ratio. You can also see that we picked up at about 1700 Kelvin the fact that the slope of the NOx uh, uh, formation increases, so we picked that up uh, quite nicely with the detailed chemistry. So that's, that's an example of using LES and detailed chemistry for gas turbine emissions. Here's an example using, uh, once again, LES and detailed chemistry, more for flame shape validation. And this is based on some work that was done, uh, as you can see, in uh, uh, Georgia Tech by, by Tim Lewin's group with uh, Jerry Seitzman and others. Uh, so it's some fairly landmark work. Uh, and what they did with this swirling dump combustor, where you've got a swirler uh, that has premixed fuel and air, gaseous fuel, and uh, it generates recirculation zones in the corner and it's swirl stabilized. And the moral of this case was that uh, at higher equivalence ratios, you actually have burning in the corners. It's able to stabilize the burning in this dump region right here in the corners. And as you drop the equivalence ratio, uh, around about 0.55 is where you have a transition, which they called an inner shear layer transition. Essentially what happens is it extinguishes the flame here in the corner. And that's shortly before the overall flame goes through lean blow-off. But uh, as you can see with the experimental pictures on the left and the simulations of LES and detailed chemistry uh, of Converge on the right, we were able to predict um, uh, that phenomena of the extinction of the flame in those corners. More about a different case, but this is a Volvo augmenter case or afterburner case. And what we're doing is looking at lean blow-off now, another key issue that's uh, affected uh, by detailed chemistry. And what we've done is we are slowly ramping down the equivalence ratio from 0.65 down to the actual lean blow-off equivalence ratio, which is at about 0.5. And as we lower that equivalence ratio, you can see how the flame, some of the flame dynamic uh, struggles uh, to remain ignited uh, with that recirculation zone. And then right there where it actually blows out, came very close to capturing the exact uh, blowout for that case. Um, flame out in gas turbine combustors or aviation gas turbine combustors is certainly a challenge. Uh, and so what I'm trying to do here with this slide is to describe a little bit about sort of the reasons why blowout occurs and, and perhaps add some, some gravity to the situation for some real examples. You know, basically you need uh, three things to keep the flame lit. You have to have fuel, you have to have oxidant, and you have to have temperature. You take any of those away and you lose the flame. And so uh, there's a number of different ways that uh, uh, flame or uh, flame out can occur in gas turbines. Certainly fuel starvation. There's an Air Canada flight that suffered flame out due to the wrong amount of fuel being put in the, in the combustor and it landed like a glider safely. Uh, Qatar Airlines in 2006 had ice uh, building up inside of the engine and that affected airflow, uh, which affected fuel as well. And uh, they were able to land, but that was on landing going into Shanghai Airport. Compressor stall and surge, that disrupts the airflow. So once again, if you take away the air, the, the engine can flame out. Uh, or you can ingest foreign objects. So for those of you who remember the uh, volcano that went off uh, years back, I think it was in Iceland, uh, and a number of uh, uh, flights flew through the plume uh, with a lot of um, particulate matter. And uh, in fact, this British Airways flight suffered flame outs and all for another one that I hadn't known, I found this on the internet was uh, I didn't realize that uh, if you that some of the military aircraft can actually experience flame out and this was because of a missile the missile exhaust as they fire off the missile that get in, got into the turbine and it affected uh, the combustion in the turbine and it blew out once again those folks are probably at low altitude so that's a challenge so um, we certainly have done a good job of improving the quality and improving the reliability of engines. Uh, early jet engines back in the, going all the way back to the, uh, to the um, you know, World War II engine and uh, after World War II, those had uh, typically very high flame out rates of about one every 10,000 flights. And I'd recently heard that 
modern jet engines flame out uh, fairly rarely. It's about one every 100,000 non-military flights. And that sounded to me like that's a fairly uh, um, infrequent occurrence until I asked the question, well, how many non-military flights are there a day? Well, there are 110,000 non-military flights a day. Uh, so that means that just about one a day uh, you have a, a flame out occurring. So that's certainly something that engine designers have to address and that uh, 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 from uh, a design standpoint, you have to improve not only trying to keep them lit, but if they do blow out, how do you relight them? But what really are the requirements for accurate relight simulation? For those of us who do combustion, I think that uh, most of these uh, topics would come to the top of their mind when they think about what, they, what really is required for an accurate relight and flame propagation simulation. Of course, you have to have accurate combustion modeling. Um, how do you get that? Well, certainly detailed chemistry uh, is desired through a detailed chemical mechanism that can capture the effects of uh, medium temperature ignition and flame propagation, flame speed and turbulent flame interaction. Um, all of that is desired, but uh, it really does take too long in traditional CFD approaches. So typically, traditional CFD approaches are using either reduced or tabular combustion models, a, a favorite being the flamelet generated uh, manifold model, or FGM. You've also got the eddy breakup, eddy dissipation concept, CMC, conditional moment closure. All of these different combustion models uh, can do quite well at predicting flame shape uh, for a stable flame or for um, a flame that isn't going through a transient, uh, as such as a relight situation. But they really have limited value for non-equilibrium combustion. So another key thing I think people would say that you need for relight modeling is to accurately model the spark. The spark is the source of where the energy occurs. It forms the kernel of uh, radicals that uh, initially breaking up part of the fuel that then f uh, form a propagation wave or a combustion wave. And so you have to accurately model that. And the key things uh, that we've learned through a lot of our work in IC engines is you've got to accurately model the energy input, the duration of the spark, and then the size of the spark. Uh, what, what is the actual volume of the gas that's being heated up? So once again, one of the issues that you have with traditional CFD approaches that use tabular models such as FGM, Sometimes that doesn't work, uh, that you actually have to inject either um, uh, burned combustion gases or some of the FGM flame progress variable, uh, variables into that source region to simulate what a spark would look like. So you're not actually modeling the spark directly. Another key thing that you have in all CFD cases is you have to manage the cell count. Uh, so um, the, the key thing that you need to do for flame propagation accuracy is you've got to track the flame front. Usually that's done with refined mesh. And then uh, the flame has to be, uh, the other key point is that the flame is reasonably small through a large portion of the simulation. So maybe you don't need cells, uh, uh, as many cells in the beginning that you would at the end as the flame gets larger. But once again, traditional CFD typically uses a fixed mesh with uh, not only a fixed mesh in terms of its design, where it's fine, where it's coarse, but also in terms of its cell count. You can't take advantage of the fact that the flame is actually reasonably small at the beginning. So modeling gas turbine relight does talk a little bit about Converge and how Converge can help in this situation. So I've got a uh, video over here on the right that shows one of the key aspects of Converge, which is the adaptive mesh refinement or automatically refining the mesh where you have uh, regions of gradients of uh, velocity or temperature, like in this case. And then you can look at here's the in the swirler region right in here, and then also capturing wall jets and effusion cooling and all of that. Certainly do an awful lot of transient, kinetically limited, and spray uh, uh, simulations with complicated geometries. And uh, detail chemistry is really something that we're very good at. We're very fast at it. Uh, so we can address some of those issues of slow run times with detail chemistry. 
uh, key aspects are also fluid dynamics and the ability to model either unsteady RANs or uh, LAS very quickly. And then our ability to model source uh, or uh, spark uh, uh, simulation directly with the amount of energy, duration, and size. Uh, so we feel that there's a lot of the key aspects of Converge that were, uh, would suit itself well or lend itself well to relight modeling. So I'll do in the rest of the walk through some of the fundamental ac uh, academic validation cases that we did for both gaseous and liquid fuels. Uh, while I can't show you the results, I can tell you that several engine manufacturers have provided blind benchmark cases and some of those have led into, or success on those have led into work uh, with those manufacturers specifically looking at Relight. As an example of that, if you go on our website and take a look uh, in our press section, uh, you at ConvergeCFD.com, you'll see in our nice article that uh, Dr. Feng Shu, one of the engineers at Honeywell, uh, wrote for us uh, talking about how they're using Converge to help model um, relight uh, not only on the ground uh, or at idle but also high altitude relight in their combustor so I think that's a very interesting article once again I can't show you their uh, specific geometries or some of the details of what we've been doing uh, but the key point is that uh, an engine manufacturer major engine manufacturer is using Converge uh, to predict this phenomenon so they, we started off with a uh, fairly simple looking at uh, relight. In this case, we've got uh, an annular combustor, and there's a torch igniter here. And what we did was um, uh, we, we set up, uh, like I said, an annular combustor with uh, multiple cans spraying liquid fuel. And we were trying to see how well we might be able to model this ignition process. Uh, this case didn't have any validation data. But one of the things I say about, uh, as we like to call it, this is sort of a bucket one case where uh, your eye actually can tell you whether or not uh, the, the simulation looks like it's doing right. So uh, as you can see there, um, it, it follows what you expect a flame to look like as its propagation goes around. It's interesting that uh, a lot of people have been looking at um, uh, small sectors of the, uh, of the actual combustion. Uh, of an annular combustor in that case. Uh, in fact, that's what we've done with several other as well. Once again, this is uh, a case that we created ourselves just to show what we could do, essentially to make a pretty movie. And um, now we wanted to move into actually doing some validation tests uh, and looking at a validation case. So I have two validation cases I'll talk through to you uh, with you today. One is gaseous fuel. And the others is uh, the, the rig and the uh, experimental data were taken by um, Surfax uh, in France uh, as part of the KIAI uh, ignition rig study. Uh, that's a program that they had over there. And so uh, they put together a paper in combustion and flame. Uh, we were lucky enough to be able to take advantage of the data that they had in that paper uh, to do some validation work on that case ourselves. So let's uh, give you a quick description of that case. Um, it is uh, five burners, and they're up-fired. So these are five gaseous fuel burners here. Each one of them has a swirler and has uh, fuel being injected from a central tube. If you took a look from the top down, you can see each one of these five different injectors. And this little yellow spot right here is the igniter that's on the back wall, and it's directly in line with uh, the second injector. You can see once again in the schematic here uh, what it looks like. So one nice thing that we had uh, from this paper was you had uh, not only the amount of time it took to ignite all five burners, but you actually had the ignition sequence of each individual burner's timing that it took to ignite uh, from that initial spark. Uh, and they had that not only for this five burner case, but also a different uh, burner spacing. So they removed one burner and put them further apart for a four burner case, and then went down to two burners only and had them even apart. Uh, so they were able to um, provide the, uh, the ignition and flame propagation and ignition sequence for each of these cases. Now, uh, Surfax actually did their own uh, CFD of this case uh, using ABVP, uh, and they were typically running between 21 million and 34 million cells, and they were using a two-step chemical mechanism. Uh, let me describe how we set it up in Converge. 
So this is our setup. Uh, this is just a schematic here of the upfired burner with the five burners and their little burner barrels. If you looked inside of those burners, it's a central swirl stabilized uh, flow that comes through the swirler and goes through an annular gap surrounding a fuel tube. So it's not a premix case, although it is a highly swirled case. So um, there is direct fuel injection, but that is mixed out quite well. Uh, very quickly. Overall equivalence ratio is fairly lean at 0.66. Uh, we modeled it using the DRM19 uh, mechanism, which is really a reduction of the GRI MEC 2.1 mechanism that only has 19 species. Since we weren't interested in emissions, we were only interested in ignition, we used that mechanism. Um, there certainly are other mechanisms available, but uh, since there's so much information that's uh, well known about this mechanism, often we find it's, uh, it's better for us to use a mechanism that people are familiar with uh, and, and uh, uh, let them know that they can certainly try some other mechanism. Uh, what we did was we modeled the, the ignition precisely. We took exactly what they said, the number of millijoules of spark energy and the amount of duration for the, uh, the case, uh, for the, uh, the source uh, or uh, spark duration, which is uh, 0.3 milliseconds or 300 microseconds. And then a fairly small diameter, this is where we uh, did move away from what their suggestion was a much larger source uh, volume. Uh, we found that uh, that big of a source volume wasn't required when you modeled the rest of the spark duration and energy directly. We typically ran our cases using a 10 million cell maximum uh, and because we're using adaptive uh, mesh refinement or AMR, we're doing that on velocity and on temperature, what happens is as that case begins to run, it's really only running about one and a half million cells as the initial kernel is formed and then as the flame propagates, the code or converge will add more cells through the AMR uh, to track that flame front. And we, uh, we summarized this in a paper that uh, my colleague Gaurav Kumar uh, presented at the Journal or the Joint uh, Propulsion Energy Conference in Salt Lake City this summer. So here's uh, the upfired rig. I've taken the front wall off of it and what we're going to do is we're going to track the, uh, that source. You can see the source initially hits and then now we have the propagation of the flame uh, in, uh, uh, for that first burner. You can see how the uh, flame begins to drop into the central recirculation zone of that burner. And then you can see here now for the second burner, which I'm sorry, it's actually the third burner. Then it will go to this fourth burner here, and then uh, over here to the first burner, and then finally it will go for the, uh, the last burner. So let me do that one more time. And we can watch how, so we're looking at not only the growth of that kernel and the time at which it ignites that first burner, but we're also looking at what is the sequence. Once again, going, uh, starting of course with the second burner, because it's right next to the igniter. It then moves, because of the swirling pattern, uh, it then moves to the uh, third burner, then the fourth, then the fifth uh, will come in just a sec. So let's take a look at uh, really how the adaptive mesh refinement works while we're doing that source and ignition. Uh, so after the source is hit, now we're tracking the flame front. This is just a slice through the burner. You can see the, the, uh, the adaptive mesh refinement not only looking at the, the swirling flow, but also tracking the growth of the flame as it uh, grows across the, uh, the domain. In fact, you can see it right there. Uh, add mesh uh, right for that uh, ignition of the third burner there. We'll watch that one more time. Okay, so let's take a look at what the uh, source really looks like. Uh, one of the things that, um, that we do within Converge, if you look at that mesh, it's a fairly coarse mesh and really a lot is going to happen in that fairly small volume of that source. So we want to make sure that we uh, we provide uh, some refinement or embedding as we call it for the mesh during the source. So what you can see just before that source hits, uh, let me capture that again, just before that source hits you can see that we've added some refinement uh, and then the source when it hits it has a nice bed of fine mesh to, to lay in essentially and then it, uh, it, it's able to propagate and then 
once the source or the spark has, uh, the kernel has begun to propagate, as you see there, then we remove that embedding that we had for just specifically for that uh, initial source and kernel formation. Using um, adaptive mesh refinement and fixed embedding uh, manipulating of the mesh so that uh, uh, we can track something that's dynamic, number one. Number two, I'm able to uh, have a fairly coarse mesh out here. Uh, while I'm able to get very fine where I need to, I still am able to keep it reasonably coarse outside of that region. So let's talk about some results. Uh, here are some ignition progression results. We've got the experiment on the right. What these are is uh, different time steps. So 11 milliseconds after the source, that's what the flame looks like. 23.6 milli milliseconds and then so on as the flame propagates all the way across. We took the exact same time steps in con our converge simulation and this is what we see. So uh, after 11 milliseconds, we do see the wrapping around of the initial kernel, which they see as well, albeit our, ours is a little bit smaller uh, than theirs. Um, then it, as it continues to propagate around, uh, we have ignition of the uh, middle burner or third burner, uh, and uh, then also propagating to the fourth burner, and then over to the first burner, and then it'll finally go for the last burner. Burner. As you can see, um, that last burner, because of the swirl direction, um, it, uh, it takes a little bit longer than all the other burners to, uh, uh, to propagate. Let's throw those on a plot, and what we're looking at is the burner ignition timing. So this is the amount of time that each one of these burners took to ignite after the spark. The experiment with the error bars or the, uh, the, uh, the fluctuations or the variation in the experiment uh, result uh, shown by these error bars. Uh, so the black bars are the experimental time, the blue uh, are converged with our unsteady RAN simulation, and then we also added the Surfax LAS simulation results there. As you can see, we did a fairly good job of predicting the sequence and timing of the propagation of that flame. So that's all fine uh, that we're able to do that for that one case. Now the question is, what happens if you change the burner spacing such that these burners are further apart or they have fewer burners? Uh, that's a fairly, not, not that you do that very often in gas turbine design, but you know, geometric changes of that type are fairly common. You know, where do you locate the igniter, uh, questions like that. So what we did was we followed the exact same approach that we had for, oh, excuse me, um, before I jump into the <laughs> moving the burners, let me first tell you that uh, we did do a velocity validation of non-reacting or isothermal flow, uh, and we did a good job of predicting the uh, recirculation zone and the uh, size and the strength of the recirculation zone for that case. So now let's look at four burners. So what we've done is uh, one of the burners has been removed and now they're further apart. Uh, still have the wall igniter located directly behind, on the wall, but uh, directly behind the first or the second burner here. Got the converge again on the left and the experiment on the right and you can see qualitatively that uh, we're able to predict the flame propagation and the ignition sequence as well. And if we look at two burners, where that they've uh, removed uh, two other burners, so they've now we're left with just two burners, uh, further distance apart, 260 millimeters, and you've got the wall igniter once again behind this burner on the left. And uh, once again, you've got converge and the experiment on the right, providing qualitative validation. If we do some quantitative work and actually plot that up. Uh, similar to what we did with the five burner case, you can see that Converge uh, does a good job of predicting uh, the ignition time for each one of the burners and also the ignition sequence uh, for burner case. And then, of course, uh, ignition sequence isn't as uh, interesting in the two burner case, but the ignition timing certainly is. Uh, and you can see that it takes longer for the, the burners that are further apart to actually ignite. So here's a case where we took Converge. We didn't make any changes in our setup other than to widen the burners or remove a burner. Uh, and we were able to just blindly run uh, those uh, same settings and get the right results uh, using unsteady rants.
So that was with gaseous fuel. Let's now talk about liquid fuel because most gas turbines, aviation turbines use liquid fuel. And there's a nice uh, series of papers that the University of Cincinnati has done on a five burner swirler array uh, by Professor Zhang, uh, Sanmao Zhang in, uh, at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, Yi Huan Kao here as well, he's a graduate student working on that work and he certainly was very helpful with me. Uh, as I asked a bunch of questions about this and they provided the geometry. Um, also Ming Chai Lai, Professor Ming Chai Lai of University of Cincinnati is doing some work on this case as well. Uh, and so what we have here is an experiment where you've got five up-fired uh, swirling flames. Uh, and so you have it's fuel injected from an injector here. The fuel bounces off this inner wall here and comes out at the edge where counter-rotating swirlers uh, uh, impact that liquid that comes off of that lip, off of that venturi. Then it uh, atomizes and of course forms a nice strong recirculation zone. Uh, different than the previous gaseous fuel locator is located right behind the middle burner and where this these cases aren't necessarily looking at ignition sequence like we did before they're really looking at um, the amount of time it takes for the whole set of all five burners to ignite uh, with not only different burner spacing so they move them apart still kept five burners and moved them apart. Uh, also with uh, operating conditions like fuel air ratio, uh, inlet air temperature uh, leading up to uh, work done at high altitude conditions. So this gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about one of the things that we've learned in ignition source management. And we certainly had a lot of work that we've done on uh, IC engine uh, simulation and IC engine um, uh, modeling and one of the things that we've learned is that in order to accurately model the amount of energy that comes out of a typical um, uh, inductive uh, sp uh, sparker, uh, spark plug, so they, uh, or glow plug or uh, spark plug, excuse me, um, what happens is that initial point when it breaks open uh, you get a large jump in energy and that's a very short duration uh, burst of energy. Now, one of the nice things about that is that very quickly heats up the uh, volume of that source to a high temperature uh, and Converge is able to manage that, is able to uh, through, uh, 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 through its thermodynamics, it's able to handle that amount of energy being put in to raise the volume of that uh, uh, of that source volume or spark volume. Then what we do is we use uh, a sustaining pulse to put in the remainder of the energy, which is actually quite a bit of the energy. Uh, and if you look at the profile of a typical spark, that's what the energy profile looks like. So we're sort of trying to model that with this two-part um, uh, ignition. Now here are the case, uh, um, for the cases that I'll show you here. Uh, this is a typical small gas turbine igniter is what they use. Uh, so we, we're sorry about using English units uh, or a blend of English units. That's one of the things you get in the United States. Uh, whereas, uh, we still have English units, but uh, about a half inch diameter um, sphere. Uh, we're putting in two joules and it's done over 300 microseconds. So very similar conditions to the gaseous fuel case. But in this case, we're using LES and we're actually using a two-stage source, which we found we needed to do in order to accurately model ignition in some of the commercial engines as well. So we just applied those best practices here for this case. Here we're looking at a similar set of flame propagations, uh, although um, uh, the once again, we're not looking at uh, the burner ignition sequence. What we're looking at is the amount of time to propagate all the way across the flame or all the way across all five of the burners. Uh, all the burners are run at the same pressure drop here. It's uh, very close to stoichiometric overall. Uh, we use that staged ignition source and uh, we did end up using, as other researchers have shown, we did end up using uh, 20 micron droplet SMD. It's a little bit lower than what we think the experiment says, there, although there's some, uh, there's certainly some more data that we can take there. Uh, we found that if we went to a larger drop size, it did slow, the, or had slower propagation. 
but we are using a detailed mechanism, the UCSD, J, UCSD uh, JP10 mechanism, which is a fairly common mechanism for people to use uh, when they uh, look at liquid fuel or jet, jet A fuel. And you can see here for Converge on the right and the experiment on the left uh, at different timings, uh, we have qualitatively captured the uh, size and volume growth of the kernel and then the propagation across the flame. What I'm uh, highlighting here is actually an isosurface of OH radical, which is a good example of sort of where the flame front is. Um, you know, the yellow in here is soot, uh, and you can see the boundaries of the flame front here. Um, but qualitatively, we were able to capture the amount of time it took for this uh, burner to ignite all the way across all five of those burners. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is uh, it's this much faster ignition sequence, uh, ignition time, than the gaseous fuel cases. This is a fairly small rig. So here's a video showing you the actual ignition and propagation. Once again, it's fairly big volume source, uh, and you can see how the flame uh, goes into and locks into that one burner. It's going to lock into the two burners to the side of it, uh, and then uh, once again, because of the swirl direction, it'll actually get the one on the left uh, first, uh, and it, if it kept going, it would go in there on the one on the right. Uh, so if we're going to do that one more time, I'll show you what we're predicting here is um, uh, when each one of these burners ignite. Uh, and it is a little sub on determining exactly when they've ignited. Uh, you know, it depends on, uh, I have this nice see-through view here of my simulation, but in the experiment it's not see-through. Uh, so they really are what they're looking at mostly is uh, what they can see to determine when the actual ignition timing is. So let's talk about an effect of operating condition and uh, burner spacing on the ignition of this uh, upfired spray rig. Uh, what we're looking at is propagation time to propagate across all five of those burners. We have fuel flow rate at the bottom, so we're varying fuel flow rate at a constant airflow at that at 11 and a half inches of water pressure drop across the burners. So that's a, a fairly common, about 3% uh, pressure drop uh, in the combustor, and by changing the fuel flow rate, as you might expect, it uh, goes up. The experiment are the black uh, um, symbols and lines. Uh, the lower line here is the 2D uh, experiment, or the spacing is 2D. So each of the burners are two diameters apart. Uh, D is essentially one inch, so they're two inches apart. Uh, so we were able to, with the converged symbols here, the red ones, we, as you can see, for the variation of fuel flow rate, we did a really good job of predicting the burner uh, time for all five of the burners to ignite. Now, as you might expect, when you move the burners further apart, it takes longer. Uh, and sure enough, that's exactly what the experiment showed, and that's also what we showed as well, uh, the fact that it took longer. Uh, we predicted uh, a little bit longer uh, of uh, overall uh, for the uh, propagation of the 2.5D burner spacing, so we're a little bit above the curve, but we certainly captured that trend with fuel air ratio. And there's some other data that they have looking at um, uh, influence of air temperature, influence of pressure drop, and um, certainly those have an effect as well, and we've, we've done the those simulations as well. So once again, here's a case where we took some of the best practices that we learned on some commercial and other uh, validation cases that we've run, applied those directly to these cases, and uh, did a very good job of predicting the effect of fuel air ratio or operating condition and burner spacing. Next steps is to look at high altitude. Uh, Professor Zhang had uh, uh, Brandon Prexton of his group uh, uh, presented a paper at 2016's Turbo Expo in Seoul um, uh, that uh, presented some of the high conditions. And these are, only thing I can tell you is that uh, these conditions uh, are very cold. <laughs> So you look at 227 Kelvin uh, air temperature and 28.2 uh, pascals of uh, pressure. So that's a typical high altitude relight case. Um, and uh, look for us to show you some of those results. We're doing some of those tests right now. I can say that we have done this, these kinds of conditions with a number of the engine manufacturers that we've been working with. So we're not unfamiliar with these uh, conditions and we're, we're working on, uh, uh, on those simulations now. 
Um, so, uh, just to sort of summarize, uh, Converge does give you many of the different things that uh, you need to match uh, overall gas turbine needs. Uh, we generate a high quality mesh at runtime, so there's really no user mesh time at all. Whatever, uh, there's three factors that we determine to determine the mesh. You choose the base mesh size, you choose if you want any fixed embedding around surfaces or walls, and then as you can see here, this is adaptive mesh refinement that captures the flame front or other features. Uh, we're using the Sage Detail Chemistry Solver uh, coupled with the either Unsteady RANS or LES. It's very, very fast. Um, and uh, certainly we have advanced spray models with collision, coalescence, filming, breakup, to try to handle some of these gas turbine uh, cases. As you know, atomization has a strong impact on ignition and flame propagation. We've got a suite of turbulence models for both RANS and LES um, and advanced soot models if you wanted to look at soot as well, using detailed chemistry for predicting either average part soot particle size and density or getting some information on soot uh, uh, size distribution. Uh, combustor wall temperatures, we do that fairly commonly uh, where we're doing a fully coupled conjugate heat transfer simulation uh, of both the combustion uh, wall cooling and uh, the metal temperature as well. So we've got papers on that also. Uh, we do have a fairly extensive user-defined function capability. So if you're used to developing your own UDFs and using those, uh, you can feel comfortable that you can still use those. Although I will challenge you to give, give Con Converge's uh, models a try as well. Uh, but we do have fairly robust and extensive uh, UDF capabilities. Not many people know about this, but we do also have a genetic algorithm for optimization. Uh, so it uses a, like I said, a genetic algorithm and the kinds of things that you could look at are uh, burner spacing, igniter spacing, identifying where's the sweet spot to put an igniter for gas turbine performance, relay performance, and, and that it doesn't burn up. That's a really quite a challenge and converges genetic optimization combined with our automatic meshing allows the kind of uh, modifications that involve uh, geometric placement of an igniter uh, as a variable. And we're fully parallel and, and have good uh, parallelization uh, through a number of cores. So uh, let me summarize. This is my last my summary slide here. Um, so uh, Converge has proven to accurately model relight in uh, validation cases. We looked at fundamental validation cases with looking at gaseous fuel and liquid fuel, both URANs and LES. Uh, we did that because, frankly, the engine manufacturers said, prove to us that you actually can predict the things that we think are important and use these validation cases to do that. Uh, Converge also did predict uh, the impact of geometry and operating condition effects. So looking at burner to burner spacing distance, fuel air ratio, temperature, pressure drop, mixing, uh, and then also being able to predict propagation and sequence and timing. And then one of the things that we definitely learned was accurate modeling of the chemistry and the spark or source are critical for relight uh, modeling accuracy. Like I said, until we had applied some of our best practices on how we modeled that spark, we weren't able to accurately model a number of conditions. Yeah, but once we did get that uh, combined with uh, the Sage Detail Chemistry Solver, uh, then we really were able to uh, get a predictive tool uh, for relight. Adaptive mesh refinement is uh, one of the things that really helps uh, the speed of the simulation. So adaptive mesh refinement accurately tracks that flame front. And then as I said, it uses fewer cells at first and then more cells as it propagates. So you're not uh, uh, required to carry the burden of the full cell count throughout the full simulation like you might with the traditional CFD with using a fixed mesh. Uh, and then certainly we also learned that uh, refining that mesh for the spark region at first is important as well. As I said, I'd like to encourage you to go take a look at that article we have in our press section of the website from Honeywell, uh, Dr. Fong Shu. So um, that concludes what I planned on presenting today. So I thank you for your attention. 
Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'll just quickly look through a couple of the questions here. Uh, I couldn't pay attention to it while I was talking before, but let me let me see if I can grab some common ones. Um, no, here, here's a very common one. Uh, what about more modern mechanism, and is there a limitation to the mechanism size? Uh, certainly, more modern or more accurate, perhaps uh, detail chemistry mechanisms would be expected to provide more accurate results. Um, when I look at the two mechanisms, I use GRI MEC and the UCSD JP10 mechanism. Those were more designed to give proper heat release uh, and uh, perhaps are not uh, the best mechanisms available for ignition modeling. So certainly you can improve that with a better mechanism. And there really is no limit to uh, the mechanism size and converge. We take in any mechanism that's in standard chem can format and uh, really it's all uh, the size of the mechani mechanism that you use is really determined by the patients you have on uh, the simulation. Well, I didn't talk about it today but we do have dynamic mechanism reduction as well that can be used uh, in addition to some of the other techniques that we have for speeding up the chemistry where that it actually reduces the mechanism on the fly some in certain cases like ignition, uh, so that's another option as well. Ah, here's a great question. How long does your simulation take? Well, it's always these shorter questions that require the longer answers, but um, uh, I can say that for those gas, for the liquid fuel cases that we were running, where we started off at about a million cells doing LES, getting up to five million cells when it was fully propagated, on 48 cores, that took about two days uh, for the full simulation. A good portion of that time was actually in cold flow, where we were filling up the domain with the spray uh, so that when we hit it with the spark, we had a fully propagated or fully developed flow with spray. So that took about two days on 48 processors. I'll always say, though, that uh, you know, the, the simulation time is highly dependent upon cell count and, and some other factors as well. Uh, let me take one last question here. Um, uh, somebody asked, did you need a new geometry for burner spacing changes? That's another great question. Um, for most of the cases I showed you here today, uh, all, in fact, all of the geometry changes were conducted within Converge itself. We have fairly robust CAD tools, if you like, that uh, allowed us to certainly move the burners further apart, delete a burner, add burners, uh, change the size of the chamber. All of that was done with Converge, and really all we did was import in the uh, uh, the swirler and the the uh, swirler and burner geometry, and then design or built. Uh, the rest of the chamber there uh, within the tools that you have in Converge. So you did not need a new, uh, a new uh, CAD file. Uh, so I think that's all the time that we have. We're right, uh, against our, our limit, but uh, once again, please send in any questions you have, uh, either through the, the question item on the, uh, on the GoToWebinar here, or certainly feel free to drop me an email. Uh, there's my email address there, uh, or you can drop an email into info at convergecfd.com. So please, uh, when you go check out uh, our website to take a look at that Honeywell paper, uh, please feel free to ask questions there. We've got a number of resources available to you for gas turbine modeling with uh, Converge. Technical papers, tutorials of validation and sample cases, and training uh, materials as well. And uh, also, please check our website out for upcoming webinars. Um, and uh, we, we typically run about one webinar a month, uh, so keep tuned for upcoming webinars. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, we got a lot of people who spent some time with me today talking about gas turbine relight using Converge CFD. And I really appreciate your time and very much appreciate you joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you.